as soon as people realized that the single junctions gave these diffraction pattern shapes and that they were periodic in one flux quantum in the junction area, they realized that they could make it periodic in smaller fields by having a bigger junction area. And effectively, what they did was take two junctions in parallel. Effectively, what they were attempting to do was to mimic the experiment in Young's fringes, in which you go from a single slit, which produces a diffraction pattern, to a pair of slits, which produces an interference pattern. Okay, so this is, in fact, directly equivalent to a two-slit, Young's slit experiment. We have two slits, yep. and they come through, and the diffraction pattern we expect to see has an intensity that goes sort of sinusoidally like that. This is, of course, assuming that your slits are very narrow compared to their spacing apart. So, so again, you can now replace this and just say this is critical current yes, and so it's magnetic field. These, these minima, now in the single junctions, the minima corresponded to one flux quantum in the junction, but now the minima correspond to what? One flux quantum in the loop? One flux quantum in the loop, yes. There's in fact another entirely equivalent way of thinking about this. And that is you could say, okay, well we have a, a superconducting loop, and of course the thing we know about superconductors is they will set up a current to repel a magnetic field. So we're putting a magnetic field around the thing, and it sets up a little current going around it to, to repel that field. So we'd say we have a little circulating current going around our loop like that. But we're also having the measurement current, which we're applying like that. So what that means is that for this junction, the measurement current goes, the total current going to the junction goes up, and for this one it goes down yeah, slightly. Yeah, yeah. The result of that is that um, eventually you're going to go over the critical current of one junction. And at that point, you're essentially getting a minimum in the, in the measured critical current. And um, as you change, and what happens then is you'll get one flux quantum able to get through this junction. And we end up with a single flux quantum inside the loop. Well, that's fine, but that actually means you've now got more flux, a higher flux density inside the loop than you do outside. And so the little circulating current has to reverse direction. And then and we increase the field a bit more, and that eventually and balances then, so out, this happens periodically. and it happens periodically. Superconducting wave function can only change its phase by uh, an integral number of 2 pi when you walk around the ring. The phase change when going around the ring is directly connected to the magnetic flux that you enclose in the, uh, in the superconductor. The theorem says the diffraction patterns are just the product by multiplying one pattern with another one. So what that means is I can now draw in now the Young's double slit oscillation, so the cos squared oscillation, the sinusoidal oscillation, multiplied by the fan offer. So the fan yes. offer is setting the amplitude of this. Exactly. So that was because of the finite size of the junctions in the squid loop. Yes, you get exactly the same thing with the, with the squid, with junctions which are relatively big compared to the size of the squid loop. Imagine throughout this discussion that I can sweep the current flowing through the squid from zero up to a value above the critical current and then back to zero again. And I do this continuously and rapidly. So in the absence of any applied magnetic flux, the current that I apply for a symmetric device will divide equally between the two halves of the squid. I over two, I over two. And we assume furthermore that each of these junctions can sustain a maximum supercurrent or critical current that I will call I sub zero. So that the maximum critical current of the squid will be two times I zero. Now let's suppose that we apply a small amount of magnetic flux. So there's my squid again. What does the squid loop do? Let's suppose that we apply a, a flux in, into the plane of the board. Then, if it were a perfectly superconducting ring, we know from our discussion of flux quantization that a current would flow in order to screen out the applied flux. And so, there will be a resultant current, I'm going to call it J, that will be induced around the squid loop 
to maintain the total flux at a zero value. But now if you look at what happens, what you can see is that when I now apply, in addition, a bias current to the squid, the bias current will induce, once again, a current I over 2 in the left-hand side and I over 2 in the right-hand side, but this current I over 2 adds to the current J so that the current flowing through the junction on the left exceeds that on the right, which evidently is given by I over 2 minus J. And so this is a very important distinction. So let's imagine now that we plot this circulating current J versus the applied flux. Well, in this simplistic model, this current will increase linearly with the applied flux. And now let's ask ourselves correspondingly what happens to the critical current of the squid. So this is, let's call it I critical max versus applied flux. Initially it starts off at the value 2I0. That is, I0 for each of the two junctions. But now what you see is that once I start to increase the circulating current, the current through the left-hand junction will reach the critical current value, I0, at a point where the current flowing through the right-hand junction is less than that value. And so what happens? The critical current starts to decrease. Now this process of an increasing circulating current and a decreasing critical current will persist until the applied flux is equal to one half of one flux quantum. And remember that we are continuously sweeping the bias current through the squid doing this process. What that means is that once we've applied a half flux quantum, if this circulating supercurrent were to continue to increase, we would have a higher kinetic energy. Remember the stored energy is one half L J squared. And therefore it is energetically favorable doing one of these current sweeps for a half flux for a whole flux quantum to jump into the loop and for the circulating current to reverse its sign. And so J will suddenly jump at a flux phi naught over 2 to a state in which the direction is reversed but the magnitude is the same. And thus we can see that there is a half flux quantum applied to the ring but a total of one flux quantum in the ring, one half from the outside and one half from the circulating current. And therefore as we continue to increase the, the magnetic flux that we apply, what will happen is that we will now decrease the circulating current and that circulating current will become zero at an applied flux of phi zero and at the same time the maximum critical current, critical current will be restored to its original value. So this is phi naught over two, here is phi zero. And then you, I hope it's evident that whenever the applied flux is an integer number of phi zero, the critical current is restored to its original value. And furthermore, as we go from a single flux quantum towards three halves, this periodic behavior will persist, and therefore we will see this oscillating maximum critical current. Let's put a resistive shunt across each of these junctions so that the IV characteristic is non-hysteretic and measure the voltage that appears. So there's V and here is the current I. Now if we plot the current voltage characteristic of this device 
at first sight it will look just the same as in the case of the single junction that I described a few moments ago. Here's the zero voltage current and here is the finite voltage behavior. This is current I, V. However, things get much more interesting if now I imagine that I apply a magnetic flux, phi, that threads the loop forming the squid. And when I do that, what I will find is the following, that this current voltage characteristic will start to oscillate backwards and forwards between these two extrema, indicated here, and the highest value of the critical current, the maximum supercurrent, occurs when I have n phi zero applied to the squid, and the lower one when I have n plus one half phi zero applied to the squid. And so if I imagine now that I bias the squid with a constant current, like this one, let's call that IB, I bias, and I plot the voltage as a function of the applied flux. So the voltage across the squid, V, is periodic in the applied flux. And the first minimum will be at phi zero, and the next minimum at two phi zero, and so on. So the way that this effect occurs is actually quite analogous to young slits in optics. Remember from elementary physics classes, and the physics of this are, is very closely analogous to the squid. And that, in fact, is the origin of the acronym. This is a superconducting quantum, because it has quantum behavior, it involves the flux quantum, interference device, and interference as in the optics case. Well, this is very pretty to behold, but let's now ask ourselves, okay, we want to make a device out of it. How would we do that? Well, let's imagine that we now apply a very small change in flux around the three-quarter flux quantum point. And so this is a change delta phi. It's immediately evident that the change in the voltage that occurs will, will be related to the slope of the current flux curve, and I've got a corresponding change delta v. And so the, the squid itself is a flux to voltage transducer that I apply a flux at one end of the device, which is a difficult thing to measure, and the voltage across the device that results from this I can easily measure with conventional semiconductor electronics. And as a matter of fact, in uh, today's standard technology operating at 4 Kelvin, I can see a change in flux, delta phi, that is on the order of 10 to the minus 6 of one flux quantum per root hertz. And the per root hertz means with a one hertz bandwidth. And we can apply this time quite a small magnetic field to modulate the critical current. Okay, so this time we expect something like a Young's double slit experiment. And here we go. There we have a nice, what looks like a nice, very periodic sine wave coming up, which is what you'd expect. The, in this case, the, this is a really equivalent, very much equivalent to a young slit experiment, where you've got two narrow slits which are quite widely spaced. Well, the first device I made that was useful as a squid was a little over 40 years ago. And I might remark briefly on how that happened, which was kind of... Uh, rather accidental. And my thesis advisor, Brian Pippard, now Sir Brian Pippard, had given me a thesis project that involved measuring extremely tiny voltages, much smaller than people had been able to measure before. And he thought that there should be a way of doing this with the very newly discovered superconducting quantum interference device. And I set about to try to make a suitable uh, device. The, the problem was at the time, there were not very simple ways or very reliable ways of making Josephson tunnel junctions, let alone two of them. And I had made several attempts to make squids. One day at tea uh, in the Cavendish, which was a, a daily occurrence at four o'clock, I was sitting 
at the usual table for the low temperature physicists with one of my colleagues who happened to share a, a room with me, Paul Rate. And Paul said, you know, here's a really stupid idea. Why don't you think of taking a little piece of niobium wire, which has a natural oxide layer on it, and covering it with a, a blob of tin lead solder, which turns out also is a superconductor. And I said, that's the most stupid idea I ever heard in my life. And it's so stupid that I'm going to try it. And so uh, we managed to find just a few inches of niobium wire that uh, was all the Cavendish happened to own. And so I took two inches of this and I froze it, a, a blob of tin lead solder around this wire and connect some current voltage leads. So here's a current lead. Put current in the niobium, take it out of the solder and we measure the voltage like this between the niobium and the solder. And I then lowered this into a dura of liquid helium that I happened to have there from a previously failed experiment. And I measured the current voltage characteristic and to my utter amazement, when I did that, I saw a characteristic that looked like this. And so it just turned out that the oxide layer on this niobium wire between the superconducting niobium and the superconducting solder was just what we needed to make a Josephson tunnel junction. And it's one of those experiments that it's very fortunate that it worked the first time because I would never have tried it a second time. Now, it, it turned out that the device, which looks something like this, was even more interesting than I had originally realized, that there were perhaps two or three little weak links which carried the supercurrent predominantly between the wire and the solder. And so if you now remember that both the solder and the wire have a superconducting penetration depth, it's maybe a total of a couple of thousand angstroms, what you see is that the magnetic field produced by the current in the wire would thread this area and you can see now that we have a squid, we have two junctions and a loop and the flux threading the loop gives us a quantum interference device. May 2006 issue of SUS, Superconducting Science and Technology, you'll see an account of the discovery of the RF squid by Arnold Silver of Ford Motor Laboratories and it's perfectly clear that as he was discovering the RF squid and for two years afterwards he had no idea whatever how it worked. He did realize he had a magnetometer but it was several years after it was discovered before people were able to explain it. I mean squid means interference and you'd think that means two junctions but it, it, uh, the actual first squids were the RF squids, the AC squids which only had one junction. Soon after Josephson published his effect, there was a group at Ford Motor Labs in America who were experimenting with rings. They wanted to put two junctions in, but they soon discovered it didn't matter whether you had two junctions in or one. And so they had a superconducting ring like this. And they were interrogating it with RF. And in particular, with an RF tank circuit like this. And they discovered that when they looked at the output voltage of the tank circuit, that it was behaving in a way which was periodic with the flux quantum, looking like this. So this is in fact the losses in the tank circuit, or we'll call that the Q of the tank circuit, and this varies as a function of phi naught. Now the explanation of this is very, very complicated, but I think the simplest thing to say is that the static states of this system um, have an integral number of flux quanta in them. But as you apply RF uh, magnetic field to this, you start inducing a screening current like this, and eventually the screening current will exceed the critical current of this junction. And at that point, you get a resistive transition as an extra flux quantum pops in through the junction like that. And that produces dissipation temporarily in the junction. And in fact, because this is coupled to this tank circuit, it drains energy out of the tank circuit. And not to go into too much detail, it takes time for the tank circuit to build up energy again. 
And when it does, it induces another of these transitions actually in the opposite direction. And the number of transitions per second um, effectively turns out to be the Q of the circuit. And it turns out also to be a periodic function of the static applied field. And most importantly for this, there is no external uh, d DC connection to the single loop. At, at its simplest, all we can say is that a DC squid, um, you measure the critical current of the junction as a function of field, or the pair of junctions as a function of field, by applying a DC bias and an AC bias to help read out the current. In the case of the RF squid, you apply an RF bias plus an AC bias uh, and phase sensitive detection to read out the amplitude of that current.